In the 1960s, there wasn't a more popular chess player in the world than Bobby Fischer. Brooklyn's talented youngster was winning tournament after tournament, smashing the titled grandmasters. But just a few years later, America's idol willingly became an outcast. In this episode of How It Was, we remember Bobby Fischer, the most famous and controversial chess player of the 20th century. You will learn how a Brooklynite became the youngest grandmaster in history, how he won the world title and broke the long-standing monopoly of Soviet chess players, and how he lost his title. We'll tell you how Fischer almost went to jail for robbing a bank, why he had to hide from American justice at the end of his life, and how the super popular young genius turned into an anti-Semitic conspiracy theorist rejected by everyone. But first, click the subscribe button so you don't miss out on our new releases. Robert James Fisher was born on March 9, 1943, to a Jewish family in Chicago. When Bobby was two years old, his parents divorced, and raising the boy fell on the shoulders of his mother, Regina Fisher, and his older sister, Joan. Bobby became interested in chess at six, when his sister gave him his first chess set as a gift. At the age of eight, the boy studied at the Brooklyn Chess Club. At 10, he won his first tournament. At 12, he was considered one of the best young chess players in the United States. Fisher's adult rivals called him the Corduroy Killer and the Boy Robot because of his peculiar wardrobe and will to win. Fisher scarcely communicated with his peers. They didn't play chess, so he wasn't interested in them. At 13, he won the US Junior Chess Championship in New York, becoming its youngest winner ever. A year later, he won the US Junior Championship and the adult one. In 1958, 15-year-old Fisher became the world's youngest grandmaster and dropped out of school a year later. Instead of school books, Fisher studied chess books, reading many of them in the original. He knew Russian, German and Spanish. Later in 1969, he would publish his own book, My 60 Memorable Games, which is still considered one of the best chess books. Fisher's mother, who, by the way, was fluent in six languages and had a doctorate in medicine, disapproved of her son practicing exclusively in chess, but still gave him money to travel. In 1957, she even wrote to Nikita Khrushchev, the General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, and he invited Bobby to the World Festival of Youth and Students in Moscow. However, Fisher didn't come to the USSR then. The invitation came with a delay. But a year later, a TV show, I've Got a Secret, sponsored his trip to the Soviet Union. At the Central Chess Club in Moscow, Fisher beat two young chess players. But fighting his peers didn't excite Bobby. He asked for a match against Mikhail Botvinnik, the then world chess champion. The refusal enraged Bobby. In a short while, the Soviet authorities intercepted his postcard sent to New York. Bobby wrote that he did not like Russian hospitality and the Russians themselves. After that, Fisher had to return home. From 1957 to 1967, Fisher won eight US championships. He preferred swift counterattacks or attacks. According to his own words, Fisher didn't just like to beat opponents, he liked to make them wriggle and humiliate themselves. He wanted to watch them break their ego. By the early 1960s, Fisher's behavior was becoming increasingly eccentric. For example, in an interview with Harper's Magazine, he stated that women can't be great chess players and are stupider, that there are too many Jewish chess players, and that they dress ugly. In 1962, during a tournament in Bulgaria, chess player Robert Burns suggested that Fisher see a psychiatrist. He replied that the psychiatrist would have to pay to work with him. Fisher began to make incredible demands on the tournament organizers, requiring special seats, special lighting, extra silence. He lived only in suites, and all his matches did not start until 4 p.m., as Fisher, accustomed to waking up late, refused to play earlier. But even under such conditions, he never appeared on time. Over time, Fisher developed paranoia. He complained that his opponents were bugging his hotel rooms and trying to poison him. He was convinced that the tournament organizers wanted to steal his money, 
so he demanded higher fees. Bobby could easily withdraw from an already signed contract if the price didn't satisfy him. Fisher's self-esteem went through the roof. Once, when he was called a chess genius, he stated that, in fact, he was just a genius who happened to be in the chess world. That wasn't far from the truth. Fisher's IQ was 181. Fisher continued to hone his skills. He had an inlaid chess table with three additional chess boards near each of the three beds made to order in Switzerland. Finally, in 1972, he came close to his dream to get the World Cup and fight against the reigning champion, Boris Spassky from the USSR. Since the late 1940s, all the World Chess Championships were won exclusively by the Soviet players. Therefore, the spassky fischer match in Reykjavik became another battle of the Cold War, the game of the century. It was remembered not only for Fischer's victory, but also for his provocative behavior. He did not show up at the championship opening ceremony and then made a lot of new demands on the organizers, threatening that he would otherwise refuse to play. The Grandmaster came to Iceland only after the British billionaire Jim Slater doubled the prize money and the US National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger personally asked him to participate. Bobby demanded that the organizers remove the first rows of spectator chairs. He insisted that the game be broadcast live on TV, but the buzzing TV cameras began to annoy him in the process. Fisher lost two games in a row and threatened to leave the tournament if Spassky didn't agree to play the third game in an isolated room with a minimum of cameras. The Soviet chess player conceded and lost the game. In total, they played 21 games, the last one on August 31, 1972. Fischer won the match with the final score of 12.5 to 8.5. America was triumphant. Fischer was invited to the White House to see President Richard Nixon, but he refused. Top USA people started seeking the Grandmaster's friendship and favor. The name Bobby became one of the most popular names for newborns in the United States. Fisher grew tired of the attention within a year and drastically reduced his contacts with the outside world. The Hilton Corporation offered the chess player to defend his title in Las Vegas for $1.4 million, but he refused. The Shah of Iran and the Philippine dictator Ferdinand Marcos offered Fisher larger sums for games in their countries, but their offers were also rejected. One of the few organizations with which Fisher stayed in contact was the Worldwide Church of God. He joined it in the early 1960s and regularly tithed to it. However, later he left even the church. Fisher lived in Pasadena, California, then in Los Angeles, where he played chess with himself and read Nazi literature. In 1975, Fisher had to defend his championship title by playing in the Philippines Manila against the young Soviet grandmaster Anatoly Karpov. But before the match, Bobby handed a list of 179 requirements to the tournament organizers. When they refused to satisfy them, he just didn't show up for the game. FIED, the World Chess Federation, accepted Fisher's resignation and awarded the title to Karpov by default. After that, Fisher retired from professional chess for almost 20 years. Sometimes he returned to the chessboard, but such games were rare and informal. Fisher completely stopped taking care of himself. He became untidy and unkempt. In 1981, because of his dubious appearance, Bobby was mistakenly accused of robbing a bank. The police arrested him, beat him, and placed him in prison for a couple of days. This only reinforced his paranoia. He returned to the big game only in 1992 to play for $5 million in a rematch with Boris Spassky in the resort town of Sveti Stefan in Montenegro. It was a private game organized by the Yugoslav banker Zezdemir Vasilejevic. The Bosnian war was raging several kilometers away, but the grandmasters were not embarrassed by this. Fischer didn't stop even after a letter from the US Department of the Treasury, which said that Bobby's participation in a private chess game in the territory of former Yugoslavia would be a violation of US economic sanctions against the country and that Fischer could face a fine and arrest for this. 
Fisher won the game and retired again. The US law enforcement had questions for Bobby, so he lived in Budapest for several years and settled in Japan afterward. In the 1990s, Fisher became even more noticeable. He invented a new chess clock, criticized playing against computers, and suggested new rules saying that the pieces on the home ranks should be set up randomly. Fisher keeps cursing the Jews. For example, he declared that they invented the Holocaust to profit from it, or were plotting to destroy the whole world and himself. He severely criticized America too. On September the 11th, 2001, speaking on Philippine radio, Fisher said that he considered the terrorist attacks in the United States good news, applauded them, and wanted the United States to be destroyed. He added that he would like the country to be taken over by the military. They'll close down all the synagogues, arrest all the Jews, execute hundreds of thousands of Jewish ringleaders. He ended the speech generously spiced with profanities with a suggestion that the white people should leave the US and return to Europe, the black people should return to Africa, the Indians should reclaim power. After this interview, even those who are still loyal to Fisher turned their backs on him. On July 13, 2004, Fisher was arrested at the Japanese airport Narita under the pretext that his American passport had expired. The chess player, who had been trying to fly to Manila, was locked up for several months. Iceland came to his aid. On March 21, 2005, Bobby, having received Icelandic citizenship, moved to Reykjavik, where he lived the rest of his life. On January 17, 2008, Fisher died of kidney failure. The greatest chess player was only 64, like the number of cells on a chessboard. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel to enjoy new episodes of How It Was.